Chapter Four of Jetta of the Lowlands by Ray Cummings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mine in the Cauldron Depths. I was awakened by the tinkling, buzzing call of the radio diaphragm beneath my shirt. I had left the call open. It was Hanley. I lay down, I in my window, which was now illumined by the flat light of dawn. Henley's microscopic voice. Phil, I've just raised President Marks there in Narita. I've been a bit worried about you. I'm all right, Chief. Well, you'd better see President Marks this morning. That was my intention. Tell him frankly what you're after. This smuggling of Quicksilver from Narita has got to stop. But take it easy, Phil. Don't be reckless. Remember, one little knife thrust and I've lost a good man. I laughed at his anxious tone. That was always Hanley's way. A devil himself, when he was on a trail, but always worried for fear one of his men would come to harm. Right enough, Chief. I'll be careful. He cut off presently. I did not see Jetta that morning, I told Spawn. I was hoping to see President Marks on my petroleum proposition. And at the proper hour, I took myself to the government house. The lowland village by daylight seemed even more fantastic than shrouded in the shadows of night. The morning sun had dissipated the overhead mist. It was hot in the rocky streets under the weird overhanging vegetation. The settlement was quietly busy with its tropical activities. There were a few local shops, vehicles with the highland domestic animals, horses and oxen, panting in the heat, an occasional electro-automatic car. But there were not many evidences of modernity here. The street and house tube lights, a few radio image finders on the housetops, an automatic escalator bringing ore from a nearby mine past the government checkers to an aero stage for northern transportation. Cultivated fields in the village outskirts operated with modern machinery. Beyond that, it seemed primitive. Two hundred years back. Street vendors, people in primitive, ragged, tropical garb. Half-naked children. I was stared at curiously. An augmenting group of children followed me as I went down the street. The president admitted me at once. In his airy office, with safeguards against eavesdropping, I found him at a desk with a bank of modern instruments before him. Sit down, Grant. He was a heavy-set, flabby man of sixty-odd, this lowland president, white hair and an old-fashioned, rolling white mustache of the sort lately come into South American fashion. He sat with a glass of ice drink at his side. His uniform was stiffly white, with ornate heavy gold braid, but his neckpiece was wilted with perspiration. Damnable heat, Grant. Yes, Sir President. Have a drink. He swung a tinkling glass before me. Now then, tell me what is your trouble? Smuggling here in Narita? I don't believe it. His eyes, incongruously alert, with all the rest of him so fat and lazy, twinkled at me. We of the Narita government watch our quicksilver production very closely. The government fee is a third. I might say that the Narita government collected a third on all the mineral and agricultural products of the country in exchange for the necessary government concessions. Marx exported his share openly to the world markets, paying the duty exactly like a private corporation. He added, You think, Henley thinks, the smuggling is on too large a scale to be any illicit producer? I nodded. Then he said, It must be one of our recognized mines. Hanley thinks it is a recognized mine, falsifying its production record, I explained. If that is so, I will discover it, he said. He spoke with enthusiasm and vigor. For you I shall treat as what you are, the representative of our most friendly government. The figures of our quicksilver production I shall lay before you in just a few days. Let me fill up your glass, Grant. The Lazy Tropics 
I really did not doubt his sincerity, but I did doubt his ability to cope with any clever criminal. His enthusiasm for action would wilt like his neckpiece in Narita's heat. Unless, perhaps, the knowledge that the smuggler was cheating him as well as the United States, that might spur him. He added, and now I got a shock wholly unexpected. If we think that some recognized producer of Quicksilver here is cheating us, it should not be difficult to check up on. Narita has only one large cinnabar load being worked, a private individual, that fellow Jacob Spawn. Spawn, I exclaimed involuntarily. Why, yes, did he not mention it? His mine is not more than ten kilometers from here, back on the southern slope. He didn't mention it, I said. So, that is strange, but he is a secretive Dutchman by nature. He specializes in prying into the other fellow's affairs. Hmm. He fell into a reverie while I stared at him. Spawn, the big, the only big Quicksilver producer here. The President interrupted my startled thoughts. I hope you do not intimate your real purpose. No. We both turned at the sound of an opening door. Marks called. Ah, come in, Perona. Are you alone? Good. Close that slide. Here is Chief Henley's representative. He introduced us all in a breath. This is interesting, Perona. Damnably interesting. We're being cheated, what? It looks that way. Sit down, Perona. This was Greco Perona, Narita's Minister of Internal Affairs. Spawn had mentioned him to me. A South American, a man in his fifties, thin and darkly saturnine, with iron-gray hair carefully plastered to cover his half-bald head. He sat listening to the President's harangue, twirling the upturned waxen ends of his artificially black mustache. A wave of perfume enveloped him. A lady's courtier, this Perona, by the look of him. His white uniform was immaculate, carefully tailored, and carefully worn, to set off at its best his trim and erect figure. Well, he said, when at last the President paused, of a surety, something must be done. Perona seemed not excited, rather, more carefully watchful of his own words and of me. His small dark eyes roved me. What is it you would plan to do about it, senorito? An irony was in that Latin diminutive. He spread his pale hands. Your United States officials perhaps exaggerate. I am very doubtful if we have smugglers here in Narita. Unless it is Spawn, the President interjected. Perona frowned slightly, but his suave manner remained. Spawn? Why Spawn? You need not take offense, Perona, Marx retorted. We are discussing this before an envoy of the United States sent here to consult with us. We have nothing to hide. Marx turned to me, and his next words were like a bomb exploding at my feet. Perona is offended, Grant, but I promise you his natural personal prejudice will not affect my investigation. Of course he is prejudiced, since he is to marry Spawn's daughter, the little Jetta. I started involuntarily. This pomaded old dotard, this perfumed ancient dandy, for all the importance of my mission in Narita, my thoughts had been subconsciously more upon Jetta, far more than upon smugglers of Quicksilver. This palsied Popinjay. This, the reality of the specter which had been between Jetta and me during all that magic time in the moonlit garden. This suave old rake, betrothed to that woodland pixie whose hand I had held and to whom I had sung love songs in the magic-flowered, scented moonlight only a few hours ago, and whom I had promised to meet there again tonight. This, then, was my rival. Nothing of importance transpired during the remaining of that interview. Marx reiterated his intention of making a complete governmental investigation at once, to which Perona suavely assented. Por Dios, Senorito, he said to me, we would not have your great government annoyed at Narita. If there are smugglers, we will capture them 
of a certainty. From the government house, it now being almost time for the midday meal, I returned to Spawn's. The rambling mud walls of the inn stood baking in the noonday heat when I arrived. The outer garden drowsed. There seemed no one about. I went through the main door oval into the front public room, where I first had met Spawn. He was not here now, nor was Jetta. A sudden furtiveness fell upon me. With noiseless steps, I went the length of the dim, padded interior corridor to my own room. My belongings seemed undisturbed. The vague idea that Spawn might have seized this opportunity to ransack them had come to me. But it seemed not, though if he had, he would have found nothing. I stood for a moment listening at my patio window. I could see the kitchen from here. There was no one in it. I started back for the living room. That furtive instinct was still on me. I made no noise, and abruptly I heard Spawn's voice floating out softly in the hushed silence of the house. So, Perona? A brief silence in which it seemed that I could hear a tiny aerial answer. Then Spawn again, a startled oath. The devil, you say? I stood frozen, listening. She is here. Yes, I will keep her close. I am no fool, Perona. Spawn's laugh was like a growl. Later today, yes, fear not. I am no fool. I will be careful of it. Spawn, talking by private audiophone to Perona. The colloquy came to an abrupt end. Might eavesdrop? By hell, you are right. I heard the click as Spawn and Perona broke connection. Spawn came from his room, but he was not quick enough. I slipped away before he saw me. In the living room I had time to be calmly seated with a lighted cigarette. His approaching heavy footsteps sounded. He came in. Oh, Grant. Good noon, friend Spawn. I'm hungry, I grinned at him. I understand my bargain with you included a noonday meal, does it? He eyed me suspiciously. Have you been waiting here long? No, I just came in. He led me to the kitchen. He apologized for the informality of his hotel service. Visitors were so infrequent. But the good quality of his food would make up for it. Right, I agreed. Your food is marvelous, friend Spawn. There was a difference in Spawn's manner toward me now. He seemed far more wary. Outwardly, he was in high good humor. He asked nothing concerning my morning at the government house. He puttered over his electron stove, making me help him. He cursed the heat. He said one could not eat in such heat as this. But the meal he cooked, and the way he sat down opposite me and attacked it, belied him. He was acting, but so was I, and perhaps I deceived him as little as he deceived me. We avoided the things which were uppermost in the thoughts of us both. But when we had very nearly finished the meal, I decided to try him out. I said suddenly, out of a silence, Spawn, why didn't you tell me you were a producer of Quicksilver? I shot him a sharp glance. You are, aren't you? It took him by surprise, but he recovered himself instantly. Yes. Are you interested? I tried another shot. What surprised me was that a wealthy mine owner, you are, aren't you, should bother to keep an unprofitable hotel. Why bother with it, Spawn? I thought I knew the answer. He wanted Narita's visitors under his eyes. That is a pleasure. There was irony in his tone. I'm a lonesome man. I like interesting companionship, such as yours, young Grant. It was on my tongue to hint at his daughter but I thought better of it. I'm going to the mine now, he said abruptly. Would you like to come? Yes, I smiled, thanks. I wanted to see his mine, but that he should be eager to show it surprised me. I wondered what purpose he could have in that. I had a hint of it later, for when he took his little auto car and slid up the winding road into the bloated crags towering on the slope behind Narita, he told me calmly, I shall have to put you in charge of my mine commander. I am busy elsewhere this afternoon. You will see the mine, 
just as well without me. He added, I must go to the government house. President Marks wants a report on my recent production. So that was what Perona had told him over the audiophone just before our noonday meal. It was an inferno of shadows and glaring lights, this underground cavern. As modern mining activities go, it was small and primitive, no more than a dozen men here, beside the sweating, pudgy mine commander who was my guide, a voluble fellow of what original nationality I could not determine. We stood watching the line of carts dumping the ore on the endless lifting belt. It went a hundred feet or so up and out of the cavern's ascending shaft, the fall with a clatter into the bins above the smelter. Rich ore, I said, isn't it? The cinnabar ran like thick, blood-red veins in the rock. Rich, said the mine commander, that it is, rich. But who does it make rich? Only Spawn, not me. He waved his arms, airing his grievance, with which for an hour past he had regaled me. Only spawn, for me, a dole each week. The smelter was in a stone building, one of a small group of mine houses, which stood in a cauldron depression above excavations. Rounded domes of rock towered above them. The sun, even at this tri-noon hour, was gone behind the heights above us. The murky shadows of night were gathering, the mists of the lowlands settling. The tube lights of the mine, strung between small metal poles, winked on like bleary eyes. One day soon I will fling this job to hell. I was paying scant attention to the fellow's tirade. Could there be smuggling going on from this mine? It all seemed to be conducted openly enough. If the production records were being falsified, I felt that this satisfied mine commander was not aware of it. He showed me to smelter where the quicksilver condensed in the coils and ran with its small, luminous, silver streams into the vats. He was called away momentarily by one of his men, leaving me standing there. I was alone. No one seemed in sight or within hearing. In the shadow of the condensers, I drew out my transmitter and called Hanley. I got him within a minute. Chief, Yes, Phil, I hoped you'd call. Didn't want to chance it, raising you when you might not be alone. I told him swiftly what I had done, where I was now. And Hanley said, with equal briskness, I have an important fact. Just had marks on secret wavelength. He tells me that Spawn has been saving up his quicksilver for six months past. He's got several hundred thousand dollar standards worth of it in ingots there right now. Here at the mine? Yes, got them all radiumized, ready for the highest-priced markets. Mark says he is scheduled to turn them over to the government checkers tomorrow. The Narita government takes its share tomorrow, then Spawn exports the rest. I heard a footstep. Off, Chief. I'll call you later. I clicked off summarily. The little grid was under my shirt when the mine commander rejoined me. For another half hour or two, I hovered about the smelter house, a treasure of quicksilver ingots here. I mentioned it casually to my companion. He shot me a sharp glance. Spawn has told you that? I heard it. His business. We do not talk of that. Never can tell what Spawn will choose to take offense at. We rambled upon other subjects. Later, he said, we work not at night. But Spawn, he is here often at night with his friend, the Senor Perona. That caught my attention. I met Perona this morning, I said quickly. Is he a partner of Spawn's? If he is so, I never was told it. But much he is here at night. Why at night? The fellow really knew nothing, or if he did, he was diplomatic enough not to jeopardize his post by babbling of it to me. He said, Perona is Spawn's friend. Why not? His daughter to marry, that will make him a son-in-law. He laughed. An old fool, but not such a fool either. Spawn is rich. His daughter? 
Has he a daughter? The little Jetta. You haven't seen her? Well, that is not strange. Spawn keeps her very hidden. A mystery about it. All Narita talks, but no one knows, and Spawn does not like questions. Spawn abruptly joined us. He came from the black shadows of the lurid smelter room. Had he heard us discussing Jetta? I wondered. End of chapter 4